Hi everyone and welcome to the Toronto webinar, The Marketing Department of the Future, Crowdsourcing Solutions for SMB Marketers. Everyone, thank you so much for being here today. We really love having you and we have such an exciting group of panelists today. These are really thought leaders in the crowdsourcing space and we're going to show you how you can use this new idea of crowdsourcing, uh, well, relatively new, so to many people it's new, um, to really help your you know, small to medium sized business marketing department achieve things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, so before we start and before I introduce our panelists, I'm going to go over um, a couple of logistics. First of all, we would love it if you would use the hashtag SMB Crowdsourcing. In fact, uh, if you tweet something about the webinar, we will choose one of you at random and give you a $25 gift card to thinkgeek.com. Uh, if you haven't visited this website, it's full of all sorts of wacky and uh, awesome and useful items, many of which are priced at $25 or less. So <laughs> I, uh, I really encourage you to tweet out the webinar. Um, this call is being recorded, and for those of you who are joining us today, we will absolutely be sending out a recording afterwards. Um, and if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We love your questions. We love your engagement. We will absolutely get to as many questions as we possibly can at the end of the webinar. So we have an, <laughs> a really full house today, guys. Um, we have a really great group of panelists. These are really thought leaders in the crowdsourcing industry. They, they're all uh, working in such an exciting space to really make things accessible to you um, as SMB marketers. So I'm going to do a quick introduction of everyone. First of all, um, I want to introduce Ross Kimbarowski of Crowdspring, which is a crowdsourced marketplace that offers graphic and industrial design and copywriting. And Ross, if you could just uh, say hello and tell us just a little bit about what your company does and how it can help SMB marketers. Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, Crowdspring is one of the largest uh, marketplaces in the world for crowdsourced creative services. Uh, we help uh, small businesses with anything from logo design to web design, uh, marketing materials, even product design, and copywriting such as business names. Uh, we have a community of over 100,000 designers and writers from nearly every country in the world. Um, and uh, on Crowdspring, uh, unlike RFP marketplaces where you would pick from bids and proposals, you're actually looking and selecting your favorite from actual designs or written content. Great. Thank you so much, Russ. Um, next, I really would love to introduce Fergus Dyer-Smith. Uh, Fergus is the co-founder and CEO of Wuxi, um, which is a marketplace that makes video accessible to businesses. Now, Fergus is calling from on the other side of the world. <laughs> Fergus, can you just take a moment to talk a little bit about why you um, are qualified to talk about crowdsourcing and how it can help SMB marketers? Fergus, are you there? Fergus uh, may be having a couple of uh, technical issues. So I'm going to just uh, say that Fergus would probably say, hey, I work for this, um, this incredible company that al – is that him? Uh, that allows uh, you know, marketers to have access to video, which is something that can often be somewhat daunting in terms of creation and ideas. Um, so let's move along. Next up, uh, we have Brian Estes. Uh, his company, Big Door, helps companies use gamification strategies to increase customer engagement and motivate workers. Uh, Brian, hello. Thanks for being here. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having us today. Uh, like, like Anna said, my name is Brian Estes. I'm Director of Business Development for Big Door, uh, where we focus on powering social engagement and loyalty programs through the use of game mechanics for web publishers and marketers that are looking to grow and engage the communities that they're working with. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, uh, Brian. Next up uh, on our panel of incredible uh, you know, crowdsourcing companies, we have Lucas Bewald from Crowdflower. Now, Crowdflower is an on-demand micro-task company. Lucas, this style of work can be really very beneficial to SMB marketers. Um, is there any way you can give some examples of how this can you know, really help SMB marketers? Sure. So we can, take, um, we can have our crowd generate um, hundreds of thousands of examples of SEO content. Um, so generating original um, high quality content that people can use to um, rank better in search results. And we can also do um, things like mining um, news articles and, and extracting um, sentiment. And this is different than a lot of the solutions out there that use automated methods. We actually 
send um, jobs out to our workforce of over a million people around the world. Awesome. Uh, it really is just, you know, an excellent way to, uh, to help SMB marketers, you know, do things they wouldn't be able to do in-house. It allows them to scale. Um, so next we have Peter Lamont. He's from Genius Rocket, um, another crowdsourcing video company, which actually works in kind of a different way. Um, uh, and it's, it's kind of like a crowdsourced marketplace, but it's curated differently. Uh, Peter, you described this as more like a, a creative agency. Can you um, explain? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, once again, my name is Peter Lamont. I'm president here at Genius Rocket. Uh, we consider ourselves to be a creative agency powered by uh, curated crowdsourcing or a vetted community of uh, filmmakers, animators, uh, copywriters, creative directors focused really on small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, and the way that works is you get the creative choice of crowdsourcing, but with the protection and the guidance uh, of a creative agency laid on top of it. Great. Thanks, Peter. And finally, we have Neil uh, here uh, in the room with me. Neil is the founder and CEO here at Trata. So Trata is a crowdsourced paid search marketplace, which basically means that we connect advertisers with PPC experts and allow them all to work in our marketplace. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Neil. For those of you that don't know what paid search is or PPC is by its nomenclature, that's basically the process of putting ad ads for your online business on or offline business on Google, Yahoo, and Bing. What we found when we talked to a lot of small businesses is that uh, the actual process of doing that required quite a lot of knowledge and a lot of time and uh, a lot of diversity of thinking to consider all of the search terms that your ads might apply to that people would type into Google. We found that to be a really great problem for crowdsourcing and we built the world's first crowdsourcing um, paid search business where that group of experts actually builds, manages, and optimizes those campaigns for you. So you don't have to become an expert yourself in paid search, but you can get all the benefits uh, that it brings to the table as a small business trying to advertise uh, locally and against the bigger players. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, so I'm going to go over just a sort of an introduction to crowdsourcing, and then in a few minutes I'll have our panelists weigh in on how crowdsourcing can help your business, sort of specific solutions, um, how the crowd gets paid, how you manage money, um, and then finally we're going to talk a little bit about how to manage your crowd, how to make sure that your crowd works to your expectations. So first of all, um, you know, crowdsourcing has been around for a few years, um, but you know, I want to talk a little bit about exactly what it is. So crowdsourcing uh, is the process of handing tasks that are traditionally performed by one person to a crowd of people. Um, and, you know, this has a number of benefits. Uh, you know, first of all, when, when work is crowdsourced, many of the overheads are eliminated, which can really lower the cost. Um, and also with microtasking and hiring experts to do small portions of work, you're only paying for the work that's actually performed, which can actually be better for the companies and for the workers. And, you know, also you see this great diversity of thinking when you put many minds to work on a problem. So for SMB marketers, this can be great just to get the perspectives of a group of people outside the organization. And similarly, when you work with crowdsourcing companies, you see a wider range of talent than you would have been able to have in your community. And it's at your fingertips. It's, it's, you know, similar to the idea of outsourcing. You know, you find someone else who lives somewhere else that has the skill set that you need. Um, and this goes along with simplified hiring. So many crowdsourcing companies and marketplace just, marketplaces just make it easy for you to find the right person for the job. Because of, you know, this simplified hiring and the power of a crowd working collectively, work is done quickly. So all these things are just extremely beneficial to an SMB marketer because as smaller companies being able to make hiring decisions quickly, uh, you know, you can get results quickly, you can get a diverse view, and you can pay less, you know, which helps you to scale what you can do with a smaller team. So there are a lot of different types of work from simple to expert tasks, and these are just some of them, um, you know, and lots of these different things can be achieved by tapping into the crowd. So uh, I'm going to run just a quick little poll for you to, to, so we can get a little bit of context for our webinar. If you don't mind just clicking right onto your screen uh, so we can get some responses in here and see what people say. Do you use crowdsourcing to complete tasks for your business? So I'm going to give you just a moment to allow these responses to come in. <laughs> it's relatively even. This is pretty interesting. I'm going to give you just another minute to allow, uh, to allow you to answer the question. So do you use crowdsourcing to complete tasks? Again, it's looking relatively uh, even. 
So I want to open up to the panel, and Neil, who's in the room with me here, and obviously we both work at Trata, uh, Neil and I were talking earlier about kind of the way to set the stage for how, um, how crowdsourcing can help your business. Um, and Neil made, I think, what was a good point, which is that, uh, you know, crowdsourcing solves two problems, the intern problem and the expert problem. Neil, do you mind taking, a, you know, just a moment to talk a little bit about the intern problem, and then I'm going to um, open it up to a couple of the other panelists. Sure. So um, myself personally, over the last 15 years, uh, I've built and run and participated in a number of businesses. Uh, many of which have been small businesses either for their whole lifetime. I was involved in running a couple restaurants um, or businesses that have started as small businesses and grown into larger businesses and thus have gone through the challenges of being a small business. And two of the most sort of confounding problems as a small business is, is sort of the intern and the expert problem. It's kind of the bookends of where you wish you had either a whole bunch of very uh, sort of cheap and directive labor to do things that are really critical to the business that are almost impossible to sort of stay up until three in the morning and do by yourself because it's just about processing a lot of spreadsheets or visiting a lot of websites and collecting data or writing a lot of content. But if you had, you know, an army of smart college students, um, you could do that very sort of effectively and it would really move your business forward. That's a very common thing that you come across in a small business where sometimes you say, oh, I wish I had a bunch of really smart, you know, 22-year-olds, 18-year-olds that I could just point in a direction and have them generate a lot of activity for me. The other problem that you face in small businesses all the time is that you don't really have the ability to be an expert in every single thing you need to do. So you likely don't have a marketing department. You likely don't have an IT department. You likely don't have a finance department. Well, um, that's a problem that's actually relatively hard to solve because you have to go out and interview all these freelancers or agencies or whatever the case may be and make a somewhat subjective call about who the best expert for your business is without, um, um, without actually being the expert yourself and being able to make that call. So these bookends are actually two of the most complicated problems for small businesses on a daily basis and it's really the core value that you'll find as you start to use crowdsourcing solutions uh, that they solve actually both of these problems extremely well. Thanks, Neil. So I wanted to ask Lucas first. Uh, Lucas is from Crowdflower, and uh, you know he works for a company that basically makes uh, you know the the problem of the intern problem. Uh, you know where you just need need many hands of people who are capable of doing work to do things. Uh, I think you you call it on demand microtasking. Lucas, can you talk a little bit about the intern problem and how we can use crowdsourcing to solve it? Sure, and um, you know it's it's uh, it's it's I think the intern problem is a great way of um, framing um, what we do. I mean, when we started out, we would tell companies, oh, you know, this is so great that we can send, um, you know, your important business processes out to lots of people on the Internet, and we would lead with the fact that it was cheaper. And over time, we realized that what our customers really cared about was the fact that it was on demand, right? So it wasn't just the fact that they could access 10,000 people say, but the fact that they could access 10,000 people not in a week or in a day, but instantly. And um, what we find is that companies have a really hard time predicting um, their human resource capital needs, right? So, um, you know, one day you might be running a big campaign and you might want to have um, thousands of people generating new content. The next day you might want to be looking at the results and you might not want um, people to generate any content for you. And so, um, what we found is the the really compelling value proposition of Crowdflare, according to our customers, is the fact that we can scale up and scale down. And this is actually really similar to cloud computing, um, which has just exploded in popularity. Um, awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I, I would love to sort of talk a little bit about the expert problem as well. And um, Ross, you know, Ross is from CrowdSpring. You and I talked a little bit about how, you know, CrowdSpring allows businesses to find the worker who's best for them quickly and then simplifies the hiring process, which is, you know, something that Lucas sort of touched on when you're an SMB and you need a problem solved, uh, you need it solved very quickly. So, Ross, can you talk a little bit about how it's made possible, um, you know, that, that people can, can find the right person quickly? Sure. What ultimately drove us to look for a better way to buy and sell services was the realization that when we buy goods, 
um, as consumers, uh, or even if we are running marketing departments. We know what we like. We see a television set as a consumer. We pick the one we like. We see um, a business card designs. We pick the one we like if it is an actual physical product. And that is not the case in service. So we wanted to build a model that allowed people to buy services in much the same way that they buy goods, so that they could effectively go to people who are good at providing these services, and in CrowdSpring's case it is designers and writers and industrial designers. And rather than asking those people to bid on the jobs, say, let me see actual logo designs or actual designs for my new marketing brochure. I know what I like when I see it because I see lots of these in the marketplace. So I'd love to be able to pick my new logo design from 100, 200 different actual designs with my company's name rather than sort through and spend hours looking at bids and proposals. And that's the realization that we made that, that businesses, much like consumers, would rather look at tangible services as opposed to intangible. And, and, and we believe that a lot of crowdsourcing businesses work on the same premise, that they help create a tangible service from something that normally is not. I think that's really interesting. You know, it makes a lot of sense that now, you know, we want to see something before we buy it. You know, maybe that wasn't true several years ago when we did work differently and we bought things differently. But in many ways, you know, uh, getting work done is sort of like making a purchase, and we want to, we want to, you know, get some context before we buy. It looks like Neil has something he wants to say. Sure. So I think you know, one of the wonderful things about the evolution of the crowdsourcing market is there's so many different approaches for so many sub-problems. So Lucas talks about hiring a lot of people very quickly to do something for a limited amount of time. Ross talks about finding an expert who's the best person for a job with a bit of a preview into the work that they're going to do for you. What's interesting about Trada is we actually help you engage with an expert that works with your business for a long time. So a paid search expert is someone that will work on your campaign for six months, a year, two years maybe. And what we offer is not the ability to find that best person to work on your campaign, but the best group of people to work on your campaign. And we let the actual underlying data and performance of how well they do on your campaign determine what sort of part of the payment or what sort of amount of participation they get. So three actually really interesting and important problems. Sort of I need a lot of people quickly for a limited amount of time. I need someone to do one job who's the best one. And then I actually need a team of people, and I'm not willing to make one bet. I'd rather make 10 bets and let them fight it out to see who's best. Um, that's you know, sort of interesting that we have those three quite vastly different models applied to different kinds of activities that require expertise. So um, I'm just going to move on a little bit. Um, one of the concerns that many SMB uh, marketers have are, how do I pay these workers? Am I paying them fairly? Is the work going to be good? And actually, you know, there are a number of different models. Uh, we talk a lot about the word marketplace or the word pay for performance. Um, so Peter and Fergus, you both run companies that crowdsource video with different models. Um, and I think we all agree that you're not competitive. You know, we're all friends here in the crowdsourcing industry, and you guys have different ways of kind of running your businesses. I'd love to hear about the different ways that you work out payments so we can get an idea of the variety of methods from, you know, two companies that are kind of in a similar space. And then I'll open it up to the rest of the panelists. Uh, Fergus, do you mind starting and talking a little bit about how you pay your workers um, and, uh, you know, how it's perceived on both ends? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we have to make a decision of the decision of the start about how we were gonna we were gonna do this with our the guys that work on our on our the creators that work on our platform and um, we we tried as much as we can to keep out of the conversation around how much people get paid. Um, and that has worked fine up until now in the sense that the marketplace has really started to dictate itself where the kind of average spend lies and how much people are prepared to pay and what they're going to get for that. Now, we do make guidance, so we do guide people towards a, a certain level because a lot of the time people are coming in to video fresh, so they, they actually don't have an idea as to what's a reasonable fee to pay um, someone for a video. So, um, you know, it, it probably works slightly different with, say, graphic design where you may, have, you, may have been, you may have some understanding about how that works, but video is relatively new, uh, a relatively new form of marketing, especially online for, for small businesses. So we do make some guidance around, look, here's, a, here's the average spend for a, a 90 second animation to explain your business. But I guess the second thing is that because all the, uh, the projects and all the kind of briefs that have gone through our system are sitting there, you can see stuff that's gone before, you can kind of 
get an idea as to the quality or the type of video that you're going to get for your money. So we get huge ranges, um, everything from tens of thousands of dollars down to you know uh, hundreds of dollars, um, and people are able to see what's come before, who's doing what, and how they're doing it. Um, and it, it's really been left up to the the, the crowd itself to kind of oust people that come in with you know ten dollars. They just they'll just get nobody looking to do the work, um, and really encourage people that are kind of paying paying fairly as they go through the process. Uh, great, thanks, Fergus. Um, we did have a little trouble hearing you. I was getting some uh, some feedback about that. So the next time you speak, uh, if there's any way you could speak up, everyone who's uh, who's listening, um, this is recorded, and we will be sending you a follow up. And uh, I just from experience with the recordings, you will probably be able to uh, to hear better in the recording. So I apologize for that. Um, Peter, um, you know, we were talking a little bit the other day on the phone about how, again, you, you work more like a creative agency. So can you talk a little bit about how the payment model works there? Sure. Uh, and, and I'll sort of add on to what Fergus said because I agree. Many people come to the video space and they, they're not sure what to expect when it comes to pricing. Then you uh, put on top of that crowdsourcing as the solution and they really have lost all ability to figure out you know, is this high, is this low, what should I pay, should I just ask someone around the corner, should I go to an agency? Um, and, and so there is that important part of providing that guidance. Now, it sounds with Wuxi that it's automated into the site with the account management aspect that we add to the process. We tend to help them through that and help them better, better understand that because, after all, on Genius Rocket, we're now a totally private platform, which means uh, no one else uh, is going to see your creative brief or the strategic brief that is the project's based off of. So that means that there has to be that element of, of support and guidance. But on top of it, uh, with the vetted community, which means that no one uh, is a member of our community if they haven't been pre-vetted for their abilities. So it's not an open contest. It is, and that's why we use that term, curated crowdsourcing. We've curated the crowd. So from that, knowing that anyone who works on your project, anyone that pitches a concept that they will then execute, that they are already experienced. You can see their demo reels. You can see uh, what, what you can source from that particular artist, their style, uh, and their abilities. So it allows, uh, when it comes down to payment, we have a better understanding of what not only the creative expects, uh, but what, uh, what to help sort of educate the client on as well. Uh, thanks so much. So I, I'd like to, you know, open this same question up to Lucas, but framed a little differently. So um, Lucas, we talked a little bit about how, you know, you make work immediately available. How do you suggest to a small business that they pay for this, that they think about paying for, for this sort of on-demand microtasking, and what is the strategy there? Well, so if a, um, if a company goes through us, it's super simple, right? So we charge people um, based on the type of work they want to get done. And we actually have a self-service platform where you can um, sign up at Crowdflower and then you can um, just start posting tasks. And it's, uh, it's super simple. So we, we throw out some portion um, of the tasks if we don't deem that the quality is high enough. Um, and then we take a 30% um, markup um, for the work that we send out to the crowd. So that's how we do. Um, that's how we we charge customers. But I think um, it's also kind of interesting how we've ended up doing payments. So when we originally started the when I started the company, we paid people exclusively in cash, and then over time we opened up an API for um, partner sites. Where, so we would syndicate our jobs to um, different sites. Some of the sites you might see where it says. Um, you know, get paid to work from home. And so we had so much work that we were syndicating um, to lots and lots of different partner sites around the Internet. And then one of the things that happened was um, we started sending jobs to um, people that were playing games. So we would actually, um, we had some partners where we would pay them cash and then they would pay um, game players in in-game currency. Um, and at first we worried about the quality of um, game players doing our tasks, but um, what we found empirically was that game players were um, actually very good for the most part. Um, you know, sort of the same 95% um, good, 5% bad that we see through all the different uh, channels that we send to work out to. So that's just been sort of an interesting learning for us. And I wonder if there are other crowdsourcing companies that use this kind of um, alternative payment models. 
Um, Lucas, can I actually get a specific example from you? I just kind of want to put, you know, this in context for the SMB marketers who are listening. So if, you know, if I want to get some help with my SEO, um, you know, and I have, want to have like a, a page built, you know, how much does that cost? Does it cost $5, $20? How do, how do people think about that just going into it? Sure. I mean, so it, it, it really depends on um, – it really depends on the kind of details of how long your content is and how specific the, the topic is. But, you know, I would imagine for like a page of good content, it would be a couple of dollars um, to, to generate it. Okay, great to know. Um, so, uh, you know, here at Trotto, we have kind of an interesting model, and I'm hoping that Neil will talk a little bit about how we pay workers here, because it's, it's also a little bit different. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, um, you know, in the context of an SMB marketer, how they can think about paying people, and also about how um, a lot of the, you know, not all of the work is done by the workers. Some of the work is done by the, the, the advertisers here. That's right. So there's a couple things in there I'll try to cover very quickly. One of the benefits of paid search is that it's a very data-centric activity. You know how many clicks you got on your campaign. You know what those clicks cost you. You know percentage of the people that were sent to your website actually bought something or filled out a form to request more information. You can calculate the total cost of that to your business versus um, what you, for example, can afford given your, whatever your product or service is. Um, we actually use that data sort of centric context uh, as a mechanism to create an incentive model um, to, pay, um, to pay workers. And I think this is actually a generalized concept in crowdsourcing that SMBs should become very familiar with, which is most, uh, most of these platforms, if not all of them, have some mechanism of rating the quality of work. And Trata, it's based on, did you sell something cheaper than everybody else that's working on the campaign? Did you sell it below the advertiser's target? But in, uh, in other people's systems, it might be, uh, was the quality of content high? Or was the, was, you know, was the logo effective or something like that? And it's to really arm yourself with an understanding of that correlation between how to look through the marketplace and understand sort of um, a uh, rating um, kind of system and sort of how you pay for people based on performance or sort of the quality of the work they do. In Trotta, it's very um, empirical. You can say, I want to get a sale for under $20, and when someone gets it for $17, uh, you pay the, you know, the $3 difference to them. That's how they get paid. In other systems, it's a little bit less empirical, but it's very important to understand that every system has evolved and become sophisticated enough now to give you some in, in indication if the work is good or bad, and that should be also a factor in how you think about um, um, paying people. Uh, great. So we are getting a ton of great questions coming in. Um, and I want to remind everyone that this is um, part one of a four-part four series where we will actually be talking about um, going really, really deep on a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today and then specifics about how to manage your crowd, you know, how to use video, um, how to use uh, the crowd for content creation. So if you'd like to uh, be signed up for those webinars, sign up for our series. Um, you can just type sign me up into the chat box and Danny will uh, take care of that for you. So we do have um, you know, a great deal of content to cover and a lot of questions, so I'm going to move on. Um, so one of the reasons I really wanted Brian from Big Door to be here is because he is the expert on engagement through game mechanics. Um, and in a second, I want to ask him about ways to engage the crowd using gamification. Um, you know, this is something that we use here at Trotta to ensure that both the crowd and our advertisers work to each other's goals. And I know that Brian can speak to ways to keep the crowd um, engaged. And by the way, he will actually be um, on a panel next week, so please uh, hit sign me up into the chat box uh, and you'll be able to come and hear him talk in much more depth about this next week. Um, so Brian, can you talk about some key ways to use game mechanics to keep your crowd engaged in the context of as an SMB marketer, you, know, you really want to get the most out of what you are putting into this endeavor? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, so definitely, our, our focus is really always on first understanding the users in that crowd. And, and once you really understand you know, what motivates them and what's going to keep them engaged, you can really start to direct that user engagement towards the actions you want them to take and, and really the behavior you want to see from that crowd. And you know, like, like Lucas was uh, alluding to with the uh, you know, in-game currency or virtual currency as we refer to it, we found that's really what the, a, a big powerful motivator for uh, communities and the users within those communities. So if you've given them a specific task, it, it really makes sense to, to kind of break that up into smaller pieces and incentivize each of the smaller tasks within that larger one uh, as they continue to make progress against it. So in, in a situation for us, you know, we might work with a, with a publisher to, to find a, a cer certain objective they want their, uh, the users within their community to take. 
and we'll break that up into these much smaller segments that are easily digestible by the users and they're rewarded as they continue to progress towards that larger objective uh, and typically in the form of virtual currency. So as they continue to progress through this and they're earning their virtual currency, they're constantly rewarded as they're making progress against that and then ultimately when they've com completed that overall objective, there is an additional payoff in that. And as they continue to engage in these various objectives, they're going to accrue more and more virtual currency. And the key here is really then to have a, 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 a reward center or redemption center where they can come and you know, pick and choose from uh, a, a variety of types of rewards that will be appealing to them and have a high perceived value and keep them very motivated throughout that process uh, and, and working towards that objective that you set up for them. Uh, great. Actually, you know, uh, Neil just uh, whispered a really awesome point to me, uh, and I think he'd like to weigh in on what you just said. <laughs> hey, Brian, one of the things that I admire about um, Big Door is that um, I think one of the things you've recognized is that every small business has their, a built-in crowd. It's called visitors to their websites, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, they can actually leverage some of what you're talking about, the game mechanics, the sort of incentive models, to actually engage users more in their site to get them to look around, maybe to get them to watch a video, those kinds of things. So from what I understand, then you guys are kind of the experts in this. Can you just comment on that? I think it might be really interesting um, for our, our for the listeners who actually like have a crowd and they didn't even know it. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we really have um, you know a focus around this directed uh, user experience or directed engagement experience for users. Um, and the first part of that, like I said earlier, is really understanding what's going to motivate them. And a lot of that has to do with you know, the status within the community and be able to differentiate themselves from you know, somebody who's just joined in the community if there's somebody who's been around and been loyal to that community or that brand for a long period of time. So you know, with that status, you know, should, become, uh, should come along or translate into you know, some kind of special access or power. So you know, maybe they get a first crack at you know, a higher paying, uh, a higher paying job, or you know they're they're getting uh, you know some kind of uh, sort of special access that you know a brand new user or you know an unregistered user isn't getting. Um, so you know that then ultimately should then translate into these rewards too, which are going to be that ultimate motivator. Um, but you know our focus is going to be on increasing that loyalty. So when you spent that time curating that crowd, or you've got these users coming to your your site on a regular basis, you know incentivize and reward them for being loyal users. Um, and so, you know, once you've got them coming back to the site on a regular basis and spending more time there, the next thing you know is getting them engaged and, and really directing them towards those actions you want them to take. Um, and because you know there's incentives for taking those actions, we find that users are, are more than happy to continue to engage and, and move forward and, and take those behaviors that you're asking them to engage in. Um, and then really the next piece of that, now that they're coming back more often, they're engaging in the actions and you know, earning this virtual currency which translates into some cool rewards for them, is really starting to tap into their social graph and encourage that virality component because that's when it's what's going to be ultimately what grows your user base or grows the crowd that you're working with. So as they're earning these cool rewards, we like to give them a lot of opportunities as well as incentivize the action of sharing this, this experience with their friends and family through Facebook or Twitter or Google+. Um, so you know that's a way to really uh, you know grow your your user base, and that virality is a powerful user acquisition channel in the sense that you've got these existing users who are, are championing your brand, and they're telling their friends and family about the great experience they're having interacting with your brand, and it, it becomes a, a a low cost but high value user acquisition channel in the sense that you know you've got these existing users essentially doing this marketing for you. But when their friends and family are coming into the site after being recommended uh, by, by a, a, a person that they know well, um, they're, inter they're automatically or they're immediately introduced to that gamification layer and start engaging in these actions which are valuable to your business. So as you see that increase in loyalty and the time spent on your site and that increased engagement and, and that focus on the actions you want to take, and then as they begin, be begin to share that experience and bring friends and family on board, you should really start to see lifts across the board um, you know, in your existing revenue streams. And, and Big Door even has some creative ways to introduce uh, uh, new revenue streams to your, uh, your current uh, business model that you know, I'd be happy to, to dive into deeper you know, on our, our next uh, panel. And keep in mind that uh, Brian will be back next week. Um, we're really going to dive again super deep into uh, talking about how to use gamification to increase engagement. So you know, this idea of engagement um, that you know that Brian has been talking about. There's there's another way uh, that was really a thread through all the conversations that uh, that I had with all of the panelists before we had this panel, um, and 
You know, it's actually not a new idea. Um, and it's very much the same idea that you would be use if, using if you were working with anyone. And, it, and it, I'm going to break it into two parts and then ask you guys to uh, comment on this. Um, keeping the workers engaged, and more importantly, keeping them working towards your goals, um, all of us really talked about two different things. One is, at the very beginning of the project, the idea of either an onboarding or a creative brief, which is sort of a way for um, not only, you know, uh, you know, the company, your, your SMB company, but also the workers to both agree and also, you know, completely understand the scope of the project. And then there's another part, which is constant touch points along the way. Um, and one of the things that I really liked that Neil said was that, you know, it's, it's not just touch points, but it's feedback. Um, you know, it's, it's a couple different types of ways of staying engaged. Um, so I would love to hear from, you know, one thing about this panel is that um, most of you are from creative crowdsourcing companies. So I'd love to hear from Ross, actually, a little bit about um, how you suggest that an SMB marketer not only set the stage for the work being completed correctly, but also have touch points along the way. Ross, can you uh, weigh in on this? Sure. So, so the, the creative brief, your, your requirements, makes or breaks a project any project. It doesn't matter whether you are uh, posting something on Trata, on CrowdSpring, working with a designer, an engineer, or a scientist. How you define what you need and the clarity with which you define it uh, helps people understand and start thinking about the project. So, so we, take, um, we make a lot of effort to make that very easy for small businesses. Um, we have 43 categories of projects on CrowdSpring as an example, and each category has its own custom creative brief. So we take you through a series of questions. We ask you questions about what you need, about your business, about your customers and your market, specific likes and dislikes about things like colors if it's relevant to the project that you're posting. Um, and using that, we actually put together a written brief that we share with our creative community. But that process doesn't stop there because ultimately, as you said, there are a lot of touch points and, and on CrowdSpring and many other services, um, when you are buying the service, you're actually interacting with multiple different providers at the same time. So if you're uh, looking for a web design on CrowdSpring, you're working with dozens of designers at the same time. And you can choose to communicate privately um, using very easy tools with, with all of them or some of them um, or sometimes none of them. But ultimately, we encourage our buyers and designers to continue that communication. So starting from a well-written brief to ask good questions, to give good direction, to provide easy updates. And because we think it's critical, we make it easy for buyers to provide an update to everybody participating in the project with one button click or communicate individual private updates to any designer or writer that they want to update. That is a critical process because a, a, a good result in any type of project, particularly in a crowdsourced project, requires great direction up front and good communication throughout. Thank you. And I mean, I think one thing, again, that is, you know, something we should remember about this is this is no different from working with someone who works at your company. You know, you have constant touch points, and you both agree on how work is to be completed, and that's always the best way to have the best outcome. So, Lucas, um, Lucas is from Crowdflower. I'd like to ask you, and I hope this will be a fun question for you to answer. Uh, can you tell me, what have you learned about this sort of onboarding process from the beginning of your company to now? I mean, you know, I'm sure that it has, uh, it has gone through, you know, many iterations. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what you've learned from that process? Sure. So the onboarding process um, is something that we've uh, iterated a lot on, as you can imagine. Um, and I think that um, it's one of the tough, toughest things for, for any kind of outsourcing company or even um, consulting company. And there's sort of two parts to it for us. One is making sure that we understand exactly what our customers want. And then the second part is communicating what our customers want um, to our workers very, very clearly. And I think we've, we've, we've ended up with a model that works really well for us where we actually have our customers do a little bit of whatever task they want themselves. So if they want to generate content or if they want to um, label search results or um, label, say, products in a catalog, we actually have the customer go through and do some of that um, data entry or classification themselves. And then we actually use the customer's results to test and train our workers. So what will happen is if, if a worker comes in and they 
um, answer a question differently than our customer, or if they grade content as good, that our, our customer graded as bad. Um, we'll actually go and we'll tell the worker, hey, you know, this doesn't seem like um, what our customer is looking for. And in that process, actually, one of the great things that happens is that we find examples where um, all, many of the workers disagree with what the customer is asking for, and we go back and show that to our customer. And so sometimes the customer says, oh, you know, the, these instructions are wrong, they're misleading, they're causing workers to, to um, answer the wrong way. Sometimes the customer looks at that and they say, oh, you know, we actually labeled that wrong and, and we should have um, labeled it differently. And so I think this, this has been, um, this is one of the real breakthroughs for us uh, because any way, any other way um, than asking the customer to generate exactly what they want, there's some room for um, confusion and disagreement. Uh, Lucas, that was actually such an excellent segue to a question that um, I saw from earlier that we're definitely going to do first when we get into the questions section. So thank you for that. Um, guys, we have about you know, less than 20 minutes uh, in the hour left. So I'm going to um, I'm going to move to the question section. But first, I wanted to just um, show you some of the webinars that we have upcoming. Um, so next Thursday, October 6th, we have crowd and community management for SMB marketers from the excellent Brian Estes who is uh, talking about how he uses gamification to increase engagement. We'll also have Neil in the room again. Um, here at Trotto we use uh, you know, something that we call crowd mechanics, which actually uses ideas of game theory to use you know, monetary and non-monetary incentive systems on both sides of the fence. It's really fascinating. So, um, you know, and this is something that as an SMB marketer can help you figure out how to make sure that the crowd does what you want it to do. Um, the following week, we have on October 13th, we have crowdsourcing content and distributing across channels. This is going to be really, really interesting um, because we're going to see a couple different ways of doing it. Um, and you know, also because content creation is so important for SMB marketers, but often, you know, just totally unscalable. Um, and I can say that from personal experience. <laughs> um, so, and then the, the final week, we are going to have Fergus and Peter back in the room um, talking about crowdsourcing video. Uh, you'll see that I, I put myself on there as well because um, I really want to weigh in on this. I am passionate about crowdsourcing video and about video promotion itself. Um, there's been some exciting news uh, in, in, pay, in, in paid video advertising recently, so we'll talk about that. Um, it's going to be a really great panel. So. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed from the chat, there is a very easy way to get signed up for these. Uh, just sign up for our webinar series by saying, sign me up in your chat box. Um, so now I would love to get to the questions. And um, Lucas was just talking uh, you know, a moment ago about uh, the transformation that his onboarding process went through um, and how you know, sometimes a customer wouldn't be happy with the work that was done. And I think that segues nicely into our question from Noan, which is, how do you manage the quality of the information you gather using crowdsourcing? So I'm going to go ahead and have Neil start by answering this question, um, just because he's here in the room with me and I know he has something to say. But uh, the rest of the panelists, if you want to weigh in on this, please just use the raise your hand feature and I will call on you. So Neil, can you start with this? Um, I can. So um, there's really a couple key things that we've learned. We, we just had our third anniversary, uh, so we're three years old. Uh, and I think you know, Lucas said it so well. Um, the actually asking the ad, uh, the the buyer to demonstrate a little snippet of the work that they would like to have performed, and the expectation of the result uh, is so incredibly valuable. And so, in um, Trotta's world, what that means is that we actually ask our advertiser, uh, for example, to write a few text ads that they think represent their brand and their voice and the kinds of products that they're interested in. Um, that's one thing. So we actually, um, you know, we actually ask them to do that. It takes them, you know, five minutes, but it, it's actually a lot gets revealed in that process. The second thing which I think is really critical is um, Trada's onboarding process has evolved a lot as well, and now every customer that comes to us goes through um, a, usually a seven-day launch process. Really what the seven-day launch process is, for lack of a better way to say it, it's, um, it's a combination of kind of practicing the interaction, sort of handing the ball back and forth between the advertiser and the paid search experts doing the work, uh, as well as actually looking at the work and being able to comment on it before anybody pays for it. So the optimizers will start putting in keywords and ad copy and tying things to landing 
landing pages, and the advertiser will actually see all of that. And before it ever goes out to Google, Yahoo, or Bing, and they start spending money on it, everybody gets to comment on it. So they get to know each other. They learn a little bit about what the expectations of the advertisers are. They get to say, oh, hey, we forgot. Don't use that word. We don't like to use our competitors' you know, words in our ads, whatever the case may be. And that seven-day process, the sort of practice, the dry run, the no-cost dry run, is absolutely critical um, for getting kind of a feel for both sides of the market. Um, actually, for, for both people. So the advertisers learn about crowdsourcing, and the optimizers learn about the personal wants and desires of the advertiser's business. Um, that's something that took us, you know, a couple years to kind of get right, and now it's just the, the most important part of a process is the first seven days. Yeah, in many, in many ways, this is just the same idea of the onboarding process, setting the expectations, make sure, making sure everyone knows the scope of the project. So Lucas raised his hand, and Lucas, uh, can you weigh in next on, uh, you know, how you control the quality of the work? Sure. So, um, Neil, first of all, I think that's super interesting that Trata uses um, that same process. I actually didn't realize that, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but, uh, you know, I raised my hand because um, quality control is kind of the the technology that um, Crowdflower was founded on. It's the thing that we um, spend almost all of our research and development um, budget on. And managing quality um, when you have millions of workers is is actually really hard. It's one of the things that seems kind of hard and turns out to be incredibly um, difficult. And, uh, but we actually do deliver high quality results to our customers. And, and the way that we, we prove this without um, a lot of hand waving is we actually sign service level agreements. So we'll say if the quality, um, and we'll, we'll work to really clearly define what quality means, and we'll say, look, if this quality drops below um, a certain accuracy threshold, then you don't have to pay. And that's sort of unique um, in the outsourcing industry, which is mostly the companies that we compete with. Um, but it's sort of interesting, you know, I could go on for hours about how we do it, but I mean, just to say a few of the um, techniques we use, um, we actually have, we hide in what we call gold standard questions that look like any other questions where we're sending the results back to the customer, but actually these are ones where we know what the answer is. Um, and if workers get those wrong, then we have a system where they have to actually look at more of these kind of gold standard questions to train them um, and also check that they're actually taking um, the results seriously. And another thing that we do is that kind of that thing that um, maybe your teacher did back in junior high school where you pass your test to the left and your, your partner passes the test to the right and you grade each other. So while people are doing um, work for us, we actually have them sometimes stop to grade um, the results of other people's work. And of course, sometimes the graders can be wrong too, so we have to build in um, all kinds of interesting safeguards um, to make that work. But we, you know, we have a team of probably 15 engineers that, that spends all their time um, building these quality control systems because it's so important to us. It's the only thing that our customers care about is the quality of the results. And I think every crowdsourcing company loves to talk about how they manage quality because that's the really interesting and difficult part of being a crowdsourcing company. Yeah, I mean, that's a part of the reason that we started the Crowdsortium. For those of you who don't know, you know, the Crowdsortium is a trade group, and I believe everyone here is a member of it, and it's kind of just a place for everyone to get together and talk about how they've solved this problem. Crowdsourcing is so new. So, um, Ross, I'm going to call on you next. I will ask you to keep your question relatively short because we'd like to get to as many as we possibly can, but I know that you want to weigh in. Sure, thank you. So, so for us, it was the principal reason we started CrowdSpring because we wanted people to be able to see or read before they bought it. And ultimately our business model solves this problem. Much like when you buy a poster or lithograph to put on a wall, if you like it, you buy it. Um, and that's what happen on, uh, happens on CrowdSpring. But we do two other things. Um, we give buyers a guarantee that they're going to be happy with, uh, with their design project, for example. Um, and if they're not, we'll refund any awards that they post because they picked their own budget um, um, back to them. Uh, but ultimately, we have an extremely high satisfaction rate. The, the third thing that we do, uh, so the first is our business model. Second is the guarantee. The third is focus groups. We let any buyer in design projects uh, launch a private or public focus group up to the buyer to share uh, their favorite results with, with their colleagues, their family, their customers privately or publicly, and solicit feedback, both in terms of scores and comments. Uh, and that gives them the ability to get more experienced experts or the customers to weigh in and help them decide on the best quality. Uh, great. And thanks, uh, thanks so much, Ross. I know that uh, we want to get to Peter as well. So Peter, um, if you could also answer with some brevity, and, and we will move on to the, the next question. Uh, yeah, uh, going going back to 
to, uh, is this on the sorry on the question of the quality control? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, the, the key, really, just a quick answer is because we have a curated community, we put them to the test, we put them to the paces, we look at their past work, and we make sure they're capable of delivering exactly what the clients are expecting. Uh, and I can tell you, having tried the contest uh, side of video production to this curated side, when you bring pros into the mix and you add a little bit of agency dash to it to make sure that uh, you have some experts helping the client along, it works out almost at 100% satisfaction. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. So I actually have a very quick question which I can ask. Mark wants to know, is there a source for finding crowdsourcing companies? So I did mention um, there is a, a crowdsourcing trade group called the Crowdsortium. Uh, the crowdsortium.org. Danny is going to type that URL into the chat box. There's a complete list of all of the crowdsourcing companies that are um, a member of it. How many companies do we have? Uh, there's over 85 companies that are members, and actually on the blog there's a brief description of most of them. That's part of what we publish when we accept a new member. So it's not 100% of the crowdsourcing companies, but it's um, probably the most, uh, the biggest and uh, most well-known. Um, and, you know, as a marketer you can go and just peruse this and see what types of work, you know, you can possibly have solved with the, the magic of crowdsourcing. Uh, so next up, this is a question for Lucas. Neil wants to know, not the Neil in the room with us, a different Neil. Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask Lucas how the syndication of work is affected by the Data Protection Act in the UK. Lucas, do you know the answer to this? Um, no, I actually I don't know the answer to this. I could ask our uh, counsel and get back to you though. All right, uh, um, Neil, if you want to reach Lucas, uh, just email us at dranda.trata.com and we will hook you up with the right person. I'm really glad that wasn't for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, Frederico has this question for Ross, Fergus, and Neil, um, and Lucas. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to give it to whoever raises his hand first. Um, are you gamifying your crowds and what has worked better? So this will go a little bit into the sort of get, Neil just raised his hand. <laughs> um, guys, if you want to raise your hand to, uh, to get into this, Ross is next. All right, Neil. Um, so yes, this uh, I think one of the primary inventions of Trotta as a company is actually getting the gamification of the activity of paid search work correct. Um, and two brief things that are important. One is we use a lot of the standard mechanisms that you would see uh, in gamification. So for those of you, we keep saying gamification, for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, this is the process of taking elements of video games like high scoreboards and getting to the next level and getting, you know, jumping up and grabbing a coin versus getting points. It's those kinds of things that actually engage people in video games, the sort of like Xbox generation, and applying them to anything you have on your website. So in our, in our business, we actually have a leaderboard. So on a campaign, whoever does best gets highest in the leaderboard. We give people virtual currency. We pay them real money. Uh, we give them access to higher levels when they meet advertiser targets, uh, and that gives them access to work on more campaigns. So yes, it's actually a, um, a huge thing that we've built um, uniquely on top of paid search in our world. What's really important about this, though, the major discovery that we had is that you cannot apply gamification to only one side of the market. Let me use a sort of more general example. Um, there's a lot of sort of new like doctor rating services that are coming out. So I'm a patient, I go in, the doctor tells me something, and then I give them one, two, three, four, five stars. All the doctors I talk to say, well, this is really unfair because if I actually tell the patient to take a certain drug that I've given them three times a day, five days a week, and they take it one time a day every three weeks, and they don't get better, well, I actually didn't do my job poorly, but then they rate me badly because they didn't get better. There's this need for reciprocity um, in that kind of two-sided market, and um, a crowdsourcing marketplace is very similar. An advertiser is the doctor, and the paid search expert is the patient, right? So we actually rate the patients, the, the paid search experts, but we also learn to rate the advertisers. So if they have goals that are unrealistic, our gamification starts to tell them that's the case and it incents them through lots of different mechanisms to actually change their uh, approach or their pricing or their engagement with the market to make them better advertisers. That's one of the biggest things we've learned in the last three years is both sides need the game. Uh Thanks so much, uh, Neil, and uh, just a reminder that we will be talking much more in depth about uh, these types of things next week in our webinar. Um, so, Ross, I believe you are up next to answer this question about gamification. 
I, we talked about this earlier as well, and I, I did not uh, at that point weigh in. But, but ultimately, we think of gamification as potentially very damaging when, when it's collateral to the whole business. And I think businesses need to be careful. I think there's a lot of confusion about what gamification is and what gamification isn't. So from, from a pure gamification perspective, incorporating these real-time elements, uh, we've chosen not to get into, into that practice. We don't have a leaderboard, for example, of the most successful designers and writers because when we see these kinds of um, uh, gamified elements on traditional marketplaces, those tend to have a very negative effect ultimately both for buyers and other service providers at the expense of, of community. So, so the kinds of things that we do are, are directed to providing lots of incentives beyond money. And I'll give you three quick examples. First, uh, we'll recognize every week, every couple of weeks, somebody in our community and do a 12 questions interview in our blog. Uh, and so we'll, we'll send them 12 questions. We'll ask them about them, about their, their practice, uh, include uh, their designs or written content so that, that people can see it. Uh, and because we have um, um, an award-winning blog and a lot of attention, uh, that's a good way for people to promote themselves. Second, we have uh, built a full-on reputation system that incentivizes people to do the right things and do their best work at all times. Um, third, we'll periodically do other posts, whether it's in the blog or in the media, highlighting uh, designers or writers and some of their work. So recently we did a blog post highlighting uh, the logo that was chosen for the United Nations campaign. Uh, so, so Pure gamification we, we ultimately reject for our business because we think it's very damaging and we see a lot of businesses that have been hurt by it. But incentives that are not necessarily gamification are, are very good. And I think every small business can look to see how they can do some similar things. Thanks so much, Ross. Uh, Fergus uh, would like to weigh in. And Fergus, if you could please speak up <laughs> this time. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you this time. Yeah, I just probably want to mirror a little bit what uh, Ross has said because We've had the same thing here at Wuxi, and I think it's it's it kind of it's when you're in a situation with creative uh, creative crowdsourcing where it's very difficult to have a, a kind of game against something that is uh, not particularly tangible in a kind of points way, if you like. So uh, we had situations very early on where we did have a, a kind of form of, of gamification, if you like, and what was happening was that people were were playing the game and not necessarily actually the the, the more uh, the, the better skilled creators or the better skilled animators, to so actually pull that that system um, to, to kind of you know level the playing field again. Um, and again, the, we do a similar thing to the way to what they do at uh, Crowdspring, which is um, we have rewards for people that are taking part within the community um, and who are actually pitching on projects, and that can get to the point where you know maybe they're earning slightly. Uh, slightly better fees on, 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 on projects that they're working on, but it's not open to the buyers that the kind of clients they hit not come on our side. There's no, you can't gain your, your way into winning more projects, if you like. Your work has to kind of tell, tell that story. So I can only really, I don't think from a, when you're working within a creative environment, it's difficult to kind of bring those elements, elements into it. Thanks so much, Fergus. Uh, you know, we are running really short on time, and uh, I, I wish I could get to more questions, but I'm going to have Brian um, kind of wrap up on this since this is kind of in his wheelhouse. Uh, Brian uh, from Big Door, the gamification company, can you comment? Yep, thanks, Anna. So I just wanted to just address uh, the last couple of comments around gamification. And, and really, you know, the way that Big Door approaches gamification isn't that it's about turning something into a game, and it's not just about points, badges, and leaderboards, but it's about that, that recognition and that status and that achievement just like you guys have mentioned. So you know, the idea of you know, highlighting somebody in a blog on, on a weekly basis um, or giving them some access to uh, a, a job before you know, a, a group that hasn't you know, established that reputation like, like these other uh, panelists have mentioned, you know, that is, that's what really what gamification is about. And not necessarily turning things into a game, but understanding those game mechanics and what motivates game players and applying those to you know, real world businesses and websites and, and products. So you know, I just wanted to, to try to clarify that a little bit and, and make sure everyone understood you know, how Big Door approaches engagement. And it's really about that social engagement piece and driving that loyalty um, through recognitions, incentives, and, and rewards for, for the users that are, are taking the actions that you're asking them to take. 
Yeah, and whether or not, you know, we call it gamification or, or you know, motivation or crowd motivation, you know, these, these are things that, like, most people are using in their businesses anyway. This is just something that works particularly well with the crowd, I think. Um, so I said I was only going, uh, this is going to be the last question, but, you know, I wanted to sort of pose this last one because I'm hoping someone has either a quick answer um, or, you know, I also just kind of want this to, to sink in because I think it's really interesting. Angela says, does anyone have an estimate of how much companies are saving with crowdsourcing in the U.S.? Or how many people have been employed in the U.S.? Or how many jobs have gone overseas as a result of crowdsourcing? Basically, does anyone have any information around this? I'd like to know the economic impact because I believe this is as important as the mass production promoted by Ford, and it hasn't yet hit Obama's job creation radar. Neil is raising his hand. <laughs> um, so I'm going to answer this question as a um, one of the stewards of the crowdsourcing that Anna, Anna mentioned. Um, so we actually have a data survey that we're um, uh, that we've put out to the um, crowdsourcing members to capture exactly this information, um, Angela, and we'll be publishing that information as soon as we get it. A lot of press, given this current climate around jobs, have been asking us to quantify how, how many workers. I mean, Lucas said he's got a million workers. Uh, so some people have 50,000. You know, we have 2,000. Sort of depends on the, um, uh, the type of work that's being done. Um, so we'll have some really interesting data probably within two or three weeks. I will also say that we are actually working with a number of people that are sort of part of the, um, uh, the political infrastructure and systems, um, both in academia and also politics, to actually get uh, crowdsourcing, uh, everything from workers' bill of rights to um, labor issues to payment issues uh, in front of the right constituencies at the Department of Labor and Freelancers Union and all sorts of different um, uh, sort of more governmental organizations to actually get this on their radar and to have the Obama administration or wh whomever else um, might end up uh, dealing with this understand that this is a real uh, economic revolution that's happening in the United States uh, and it's one that's affecting um, people in a very positive way because fundamentally what it does is it, re it uh, crowdsourcing removes geography from the supply demand issue in jobs. So a lot of jobs issues are simply actually jobs that are near me issues. And now if any job that's in the United States is near you because of a crowdsourcing marketplace, uh, it can have a very positive effect on the ability to um, move the economy forward. So again, this is a topic I could talk about forever because I'm so passionate about uh, the long-term prospect of crowdsourcing changing the economic dy dynamic of the United States and other countries. We don't have the data yet, but very, very soon. So it's a fantastic question. Thanks. Um, we are definitely going over our time. Uh, Lucas has raised his hand, so I'm going to give him one minute to answer, and then we're going to wrap up. Lucas? So just to jump in real quickly on, on both sides of that, um, you know, so one, I'm, in, I'm actually in Washington today and was meeting with um, Anish Chopra at the at the White House about um, exactly what Neil was talking about because uh, I think crowdsourcing gives the opportunity to actually bring um, jobs back from overseas and and employ a lot of folks that would have trouble um, getting normal employment and in terms of the ROI um, you know I think it'd be great when um, Neil uh, releases kind of a bigger report but we do have we do have concrete case studies on the Crowdflower website about um, how our customers have saved. Um, specific amounts of money, and this is our, in our own um, customers' words, comparing um, in-house staffing or outsourcing to um, using Crowdflower Solution. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Everyone, we have had just a really lot of information today. Super, super fabulous. We really appreciate you being here. Um, remember that if you would like some more in uh, information about how crowdsourcing can help your SMB business, uh, come to our next webinars over the next three weeks. The panelists have been amazing. Everyone, Ross from CrowdSpring, Lucas from CrowdFlower, Fergus from Wuxi, Peter from Genius Rocket, Brian from Big Door, and Neil and myself here from Trata. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is the end of the webinar. Thanks for having us. Ladies and gentlemen, does this conclude the conference call for today? We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.